Welcome to Surf Strong Elite, conversations for a healthy surf community. I'm your host, Greg Finch. Before we dive in, I wanna let you know that these episodes will either stream or be recorded live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So we encourage you to join in, ask questions, make comments. If you follow myself, Greg Finch, or Surf Strong Fit on any of those channels, you can participate in the conversation and ask questions. We encourage you to do so. It makes the episodes dynamic, interesting, and reach more of the surf community. Today's conversation is with Mike Clancy, author of the book, Surf Trip, A Coming of Age Story in the Golden Era of Surfing. Most of his career was spent at the U.S. Navy's Fleet Numerical, Meteorology, and Oceanography Center in Monterey, where he worked for 28 years and retired in 2011 as the director. Mike is also in front of the camera in the upcoming feature film, A Long Road to Dow, inspired by the book, Dow of Surfing, Finding Depth at Low Tide. We talk about these, surf forecasting, and how he stays in the ocean in his eighth decade. Here's our conversation with Mike Clancy. I apologize ahead of time for the quality of my audio. My microphone decided to stop, but thankfully Mike talks most of the time and his quality of his audio is much better. Hey Mike, how are you doing today? Hi Greg, how are you doing? Pretty good, thanks for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm looking forward to it. Great to be here with you guys. All right. So um, I always I tend to start my uh, Q and A off with this. Did you get to surf today? We got to get the important questions done first. <laughs> that is an important question. No, <laughs> I didn't surf today. It was a little bit uh, windy and rainy up here in the Santa Cruz area, so I didn't get out today. But uh, hope to get out on Thursday. Yeah, nice. So uh, think back on your last wave, good, bad, or ugly, and just describe it for us. Well, I'm a longboarder, and um, I usually surf at Pleasure Point up in Santa Cruz, which is a is a, a great longboard spot. It's like, I think, uh, Longboard Magazine years ago rated as one of the top 10 longboard spots in the world, so it's a great longboard wave. And um, I, oftentimes, uh, I surf down at Second Peak, which is a really good longboard wave. And um, so my last wave, I, I, you know, got it at the peak, got a set wave, and um uh, had a pretty fast uh, open face all the way down to uh, in front of Jack O'Neill's house, the late Jack O'Neill. And that's always kind of a, a fun thing to, to think about. And uh, went in on that wave and had a good session. Oh, yeah, that's good. I know Pleasure Point. Well, I lived in um, Santa Cruz. See, that would have been 96 through 99. Off and off. Fantastic. Not Fantastic. But, yeah, yeah I was- um, yeah, I, I started surfing. I, I moved here in, in 83, and so I started surfing Pleasure Point in the early 80s and pretty much made it my my main break. And so I'm sure uh, we may have been out in the water together sometime back then. Yeah, and I I, I have uh, – that's really where – like I started surfing when I was 15, um, but mm-hmm. I grew up in Southern California in the Valley, so yeah. it would be like as soon as I actually got my own – got my driver's license, you know, maybe once a week I'd make it down there. So I really think of my surfing starting when I moved to Santa Cruz and I was able to Mm -hmm. surf every day, multiple times a day and just kind of immerse yourself in that. And that happened often at, um, on the, on pleasure point, you know, certainly not all the way up at at the, at the top on even second peak. I was down a little farther, you know, kind of getting some, uh, scraps here and working my way up but um yeah that's a special place and i still i'll stay where i'm in morro bay california so yeah. I, yeah. i'll still drive up when uh when there's a nice swell going and i'll get a couple days up there yeah i mean there's santa cruz is a great surf town tremendous surf culture there and so many varied breaks and one of the great things about santa cruz it's um you know it's almost always good because it's yeah pretty insensitive to the wind. Yeah, I grew up in Florida and in Florida, it's all about the local wind. The waves can be really crappy. It'll get good for an hour when wind switches and it'll switch back and it'll get bad again. In Santa Cruz, you're pretty much impervious to the wind because you have the kelp line out there, you know, which yeah. I have at Morro Bay as well. It keeps the chop down, but also the prevailing wind is out of the Northwest and um, you know, it's Northern side of the Monterey Bay. So the wind just kind of wraps around and you normally get either, well, you normally get a side side offshore kind of wind or not much wind at all. And the, the kelp keeps yeah. the, the shop down. 
what I always say about pleasure point is I never worry about the wind. I, it's, I'm really kind of gauging my sessions based on tide more than anything else. And uh, the only time it ever ble- pretty much ever blows out is when a cold front goes through in the wintertime. It'll blow out, get a strong south wind, but that doesn't happen that often. So, you know, it's a very, very consistent spot. It just uh, opens the window up so much more in, in Morro Bay here. There's places to, you know, you can go up and down the coast and kind of find some places to hide, but we don't have that kelp line prominent like you do in uh-huh. Santa Cruz or even down in Carmel. And so we are really susceptible to the wind. So it's like a little turn and it's like, okay. And so it does, it shrinks your windows down. So when you, yeah. when you don't have to worry about that as much, it's nice to have a lot more options in the, in the day and the week for sure to surf. Yeah, that's, that's back in Florida, you know, it would, it would change so fast and also it would get good for like a day maybe. And then, you know, you're waiting for another week or so, but you know, in, in Santa Cruz, you get a swell come in, particularly in the wintertime, it's going to be going off for about a week, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, you, you're pretty much kind of looking at the tide more than anything else. Talk a little bit about um, growing up in Florida and during that stretch, what would that timetable have been when you were starting to learn to surf in Florida? Well, I started when I was 12, and that was back in 1963. Um, Just a little bit about the history of surfing on the East Coast. Back in the 30s through um, the um, mid-40s, through through the beginning of World War II, um, there was a fair amount of surfing done on the East Coast, um, including in Florida, on the old um, Tom Blake-style paddle boards and all that, as was pretty much in parallel what was going on in California. When World War II happened, Surfing pretty much shut down on the East Coast. There wasn't, the East Coast never achieved a critical mass of surfers, unlike California. In California, surfing kept going right through World War II and it kept on going. In Florida, it, it died, and on, on the East Coast, it really died out with World War II. So the 50s, there wasn't really any surfing happening. So there was a second wave of surfing that happened in the early 60s. And I kind of call that the Gidget era. You know, it's when the Gidget yeah. movies came out and the first, the, fir- the very first phone surfboards were fiberglass and foam boards were made that sparked a boom on the East coast and in Florida. And I was part of that, that second wave. And I started when I was 12 in my hometown of New Smyrna beach, Florida on the East coast, which is a a really great surf town. It's produced in recent years, produced some of the top pros on the East coast, people like uh, Greg Geiselman and Evan Geiselman and Neil Schweitzer guys who've done really well on the pro tour. So it's a, it's a really good surf town. There's an inlet there which tends to focus the waves. Um, there's a jetty and inlet. And so the, you know, the surf has gotten, it's become one of the better spots on the East coast in recent years. But back when I started, um, I was one of the first, um, I guess I was in the initial about, you know, I was probably the seventh or eighth guy to have a surfboard in town. And I was kind of a little grimy. I was like 12 and the guys that were the leaders, the older guys, they were like in high school, you know, they were high school seniors, <laughs> you know, so, I was like a little junior high school kid and um, they really took me under their wing. You know, the, the top three guys in my hometown, Buddy Wright, Skipper Upland, Gordon Smith, they were like the top three guys. and Everyone looked up to them, you know, in so many ways. They kind of took me under their wing and got me surfing. I got a funny story about um, well, those early days. You know, I would, I, when I got my first board, you know, the, the good guys, the, the older guys, they'd be out there, you know, catching waves. And there's particular one day, but I, I was usually on the inside catching the white water. I was just learning, you know, just learning how to stand up. And um, one of my friends, his name was Ronnie Galberth. He was one of the original guys. And he was out there on a day. And I guess about a half a dozen guys were out there. It was about a five foot day and pretty good ways. And I was kind of on the inside. So they said, oh, come on outside. So they that's the first time I'd ever paddled outside and, and, and caught an unbroken wave. So I, my very first wave, I catch it, you know, I stand up and I'm, angling you know and i'm just really stoked you know i'm making this wave and so my friend ronnie galberth is paddling out he's an older guy he's like about you know he's like about 21 at the time i'm 12 and he's cheering me on yay yay he's really giving me all kinds of encouragement i'm heading and heading and suddenly i realize that i don't know how to cut back and i'm heading right at him and he's cheering and cheering and cheering all of a sudden the cheering stops and i run right into him you know Board goes right over, Skig hits, you know, puts a big ding in his board. He's a really big, strong guy, but fortunately, he didn't beat me up. And that was my first time I ever caught an unbroken wave and wrote and actually angled. <laughs> but I had to learn how to cut back later on. You you wonder how 
long it took him to realize that you were not going to turn. He was probably so stoked for you, knowing that it was, you know, one of your first, if not your first wave, and it was like, cheer, 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 and then like, uh oh. <laughs> that's, exactly what that's exactly what happened <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about um kind of that time so your book uh surf trip a coming of age story in the golden era of surfing is it kind of yeah. focused around the florida scene or does it go it a little bit there's, longer here's the book right here it's actually pretty popular it's been selling um you can get it on all the major booksellers and it's been selling all around yeah. the world uh when, when i was um 16 <clears throat> Um, my older friends, um, Skipper Eplin, Gordon Smith, and his brother, Jimmy Smith, they decided they were going to take a, a surf trip to California. This was the summer of 67. And, um, you know, I ran into them, I ran into my friend Skipper one day and he said, Hey, want to go on with this trip? And I said, heck yeah. So I talked my mother into it. So it was me, I was 16 and I think Jimmy was, was, was probably 18 and um gordon was probably 20 and skipper was 21 so i was the baby of the group and um we had this really cool jimmy's station wagon it was really classic it was like a perfect uh, car for a surf trip you know if you can see the picture of it right there you know it's like a like they called it the tin woody so we had our boards loaded on there so we right. load up the boards and <clears throat> head to california and um one of the first trips any florida surfers took to california you know we were kind of in the leading wave there and and california really was the um kind of the promised land back then florida was kind of playing catch up so we had lots of adventures and uh went down to mexico and surf I, we surfed pretty much from malibu south spent a lot of time in the san diego area and um <clears throat> the book is basically a story of all the adventures we had so imagine you know a bunch of teenagers you know, in California for the first time for a couple of weeks, a bunch of surfers doing, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. We surfed trestles and we surfed a lot of the breaks down in um, a lot of the San Diego breaks, had uh, some adventures down in Mexico. And that's what the book is all about. It's pretty fun. A lot of people get a yeah. kick out of it. Yeah, that's fun. It's nice to put those uh, stories down too for um, not just your own history and your friends, but you start tying it to eras of surfing and different things and the question i have for you is can i my daughter's 15 now and i can't imagine letting her go on a road trip in a year from now to cross the country it was just it was a different yeah like have an adventure go have a good time <laughs> well it's funny because um you know i one of the ways i taught my mother into letting me go was my friend skipper was you know he's 21 and um you know, she thought, well, he'll be a good, he'll be a good, um, you know, um, he'll be a good chaperone for him, you know. And so she ran into Skipper's mother one day and said, well, the only reason I'm letting Mike go is because I know Skipper's such a mature young man. He'll be a perfect chaperone. His mother just burst out laughing. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> He knows how to, he knows how to act in front of a friend's parents. You know, that's a good skill to have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> lots of adventures, so, and uh, it, it was a pretty fun story. So, as um, I, I want to talk a, about your, uh, your your career, and what I want to kind of segue into for that is um, looking at your career, and as we're going to talk through it, and and the different iterations and the different eras of it. Um, what is one part, or multiple parts, for that mere, matter? Uh, of the path of your career that took you in a place that you didn't expect? Well, you know, I was always interested in the ocean. You know, I grew up right across the street from the ocean in Florida, and I got interested in oceanography, you know, as a, as a, as a kid. Uh, one, of, one of my neighbors, uh, his name is Tom Lee. His, um, he became an oceanographer at the University of Miami, and he was, you know, quite a bit older than me, but I kind of followed his career and kind of followed his footsteps in many ways. So I was very interested in the ocean. That led me to oceanography. And um, there's a school uh, in Melbourne called Florida Institute of Technology. And at the time, they were one of the few country, one of the few schools in the, in the country offering degrees in oceanography. So that drew me there. And um, I was able to keep on surfing there because it's, you know, a lot of great surf spots nearby. So that led me in that direction. And then I <clears throat> went to um, 
after I graduated there, I did very well. I had it, I was on a full scholarship and graduated first in my class. And then I went down to um, the University of Miami and um, was a year in the ocean army department. Then I got interested in meteorology. So I switched departments from ocean army to meteorology, which ended up being a fantastic move. Little did I know at the time, but it was a fantastic move because my Navy career involved both oceanography and meteorology. So that was a good thing. Um, the unexpected thing is it was the summer of, um, 74 and I guess that spring someone, and I can't remember who it was, gave me a walk by my desk at the University of Miami and gave me a, a brochure about a, a program at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. It's about as landlocked as you can get, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, it was a summer, um, fellowship in scientific computing. They said, Hey, you should apply for this. So I applied for it and I got it. And so summer of 74, I was headed off to, um, Boulder, Colorado to work at NCAR, which is a really cool place. And the first day I walked in, you know, I, um, met the woman who was running the program and she kind of looked at my resume and say, well, I think, you know, you got a little bit of oceanography and meteorology here. I'm going to have you work with these two guys from Florida state university here on postdocs. Dana Thompson and Harley Hulbert. And um, so I started working with them just, just based on that one snap decision this woman made, said, well, you're gonna, I'm gonna assign you to these two guys. Well, it turns out they were um, finishing up their postdoc at NCAR and they were gonna then be working for the Navy. They were gonna leave there and go to work for Navy at the Naval Research Lab in, in Washington, DC. And so that led me down that path toward Naval Oceanography. And that basically set the stage for the rest of my career. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, am it's amazing how sometimes just chance, what feels like chance sets you on a course. And that's, of course, happens in so many iterations in our life. But, you know, she Absolutely could have decided right. one thing and your path could have been completely different. Absolutely right. Initially, I, I you know, that led me to for for about six years, I worked um, down in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi on the Gulf Coast. And uh, I was out of, unfortunately, out of, well, I was doing a little bit of surfing then. I was surf on the Florida Panhandle and uh, you know, Pensacola, but that was a kind of a pretty good drive and the waves are never that great there. But I was pretty much, I was heavy into Hobie cat sailing. I, I'd been doing a lot of Hobie cat sailing down in Miami when I was in school there. And I got really into that and, uh, competed in the nationals one year down in, down in, uh, down in, uh, St. Petersburg. But one of the first assignments I had there was to, uh, start developing ocean prediction models for, uh, Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center, which is in Monterey. And so um, I made my first trip to Monterey and I thought, wow, this is a really neat place. And now, uh, by the way, it wasn't lost to me that Santa Cruz is just a short distance away. <laughs> so I kept making trips there and took, took my wife on a couple of them. She fell in love with the area too. So we decided, well, we get an opportunity. We'll, we'll move out there. And, and in 1983, a position came open. Uh, that I applied for and got in uh, in Monterey at Fleet and Miracle. And uh, so we moved to California and I got immediately back into surfing in, in Santa Cruz area. But going to work for Fleet and Miracle, that's Fleet and Miracle Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey, it was like a match made in heaven. It was the perfect vehicle for my career. I mean, it couldn't have been any better. It was meteorology, it was oceanography, it was computer modeling, it was supercomputers, all the stuff that I had had been you know, working on and been involved with to that point. Also lots of um, leadership opportunities there. The organization back then was about two thirds civilian, one third military. And the military was always turning over. And so the civilians were there to kind of maintain the corporate memory. And so there was lots of leadership opportunities in the civilian side of the organization. And I had a natural tendency to gravitate towards leadership positions. So that, you know, helped me climb right up through the through the through the hierarchy there and by the I would say the late 90s I was um, pretty much um, regarded as the I think it'd be fair to say I was kind of the face and the voice of Fleet and Miracle whenever um, there was an international meeting or something and they wanted representation from Fleet and Miracle they'd, they'd ask for me and I'd be the guy who would go so I traveled all over the world and made lots of presentations and involved in lots of international meetings and things like that. I was often on TV, uh, sometimes uh, CNN or Fox News or Discovery Channel or History Channel would, would come around and want to hear about what we were doing for the Navy. By the way, Fleet of Miracle basically is the Navy's weather and ocean prediction center. So 
we ran and do run uh, weather and ocean prediction models. Yeah, in in the early days of Surfline, I was often on the phone with uh, Sean Collins, the late Sean Collins, who was the founder of Surfline. And I I got an interesting story on that. And that is um, one time uh, Sean Collins called me, and this was probably in the probably in the late eighties early 90s and he called me and said you know i i've noticed uh with your 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 gsum model it's a global spectral ocean wave model that um in particular for um southern hemisphere swell it's always tends to be a little bit late you know and um you know no one else had told me that and, and all the navy users no one had ever noticed that forecast tendency well it turns out there was a real good reason for it and the reason is because the earth isn't really a perfect sphere you know, it's an oblate spheroid, you know, it's kind of flattened at the poles and it's, you know, it's thicker in the equator. And uh, the model wasn't taking that into account. So it was actually causing the swell arrival to be late. And we, you know, we, based on what Sean Collins told me, we were able to address that issue and fix that problem. So that was kind of interesting connection between, between, um, you know, surfing and, and oceanography. Oh, another time I was back and this is before the internet. We, we had this thing called NODS, Naval Oceanographic Data Distribution System. And it was a dial-up system where before there was an internet, you had to dial into our modems and you could download some products, you know. And one time I was um, at a surf shop on the East Coast. I was on vacation. I'd walked in there and all of a sudden I look on the wall and there's one of our charts they had downloaded and they'd hung on the wall for people to, you know, it was the early days of surf prediction. And then another fun thing happened. One time I saw this surf movie and... Um, I think it was about a contest or something in Puerto Rico. And early on, they, they were showing some stuff. You know, they showed this chart that came from Fleet and Miracle <laughs> predicting when the waves were going to be there. So that was kind of neat. But anyway, it was a perfect vehicle for me. I was blessed to work there. It was a, it's a wonderful organization. It was great working for the Naval Meteorology and Ocean Army Command. And, um, and um, by, you know, by 2000, I think I held the title of Chief Scientist and Deputy Technical Director. I was one level from the top. And then in 2005, I became a technical and scientific director, which was the senior civilian position. And I um, spent six years doing that. And then I uh, retired in, uh, in, um, in 2000 and, um, 2011. So are the, are the, at, at Fleet Numerical, are they modeling for predictions? I would imagine globally, right? <clears throat> What's Absolutely, the- yeah. So the focus of that, whether you break it down in like what a day-to-day um, kind of normal day would be for your staff level, what they're working on to do it, and then um, for the parts that we can talk about, I'm sure there's parts that we can't talk about, but mm-hmm. how they're then implementing the the data and the predictions that you're doing, whether that's, is that moving fleet, is that moving, you know, personnel like how are they applying that science that you that you're coming up with that's a great question yeah um well you know there's um there's actually two organizations there in monterey there's the naval research laboratory marine meteorology division and they are co-located with fleet numerical in their fleet numerical uh, nrl marine meteorology division they're the scientists part of the deal they're the ones who develop the models that fleet numerical would then run operationally fleet numerical is operational Weather and Ocean Prediction Center, so operating 24 by 7 <coughs> all, all around the clock. Kind of divide Fleet and Miracle into roughly two sides. The operational side, the people who are making the computers work, um, making the ops run work. You know, every every um, 12 hours, we have this very complex suite of models that they are interactive and complementary and lots of data coming in and every data being assimilated and going into models and all that's automated, but there are computer operators that have to <clears throat> make all that work. And then the people who are working to implement new models, implement improvements in the models, uh, continual tech refresh of the uh, computer system, um, high performance computing, you know, some of the most expensive and powerful computers in the world, continually replacing them, lifespan typically about three years. So continual replacement of all that. and you know, I was involved with basically managing all of that, that kind of um, science and technology. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of operational obviously happening all at once and Mm -hmm. keeping, and and you touched on it earlier too, um, being the naval component of it, the staff turnover that you're talking about and the, and, Mm -hmm. and having citizen, you know, to keep continuity that, Mm -hmm. 
refresh on the naval side must have been yeah. logistically very difficult. Yeah, the, the great thing about the model of Fleet and Miracle, you know, having the, the military there and the civilians there is that the military officers coming in, they're usually coming from the fleet. They've been out there. They've been on a carrier. They've been on a, gotcha. on a cruiser or whatever, and they've used their products. You know, they were, you know, they're, they're out there. Might have been a fleet meteorologist aboard the carrier whose responsibility is to forecast the weather and tell the pilots whether or not they can safely fly today, you know, that kind of thing. And so they're, they have a very, you know, important job. And they would be reaching back to get products from us, satellite pictures and model predictions and all that. So they would come in with a fresh view of what was good, what was bad, what worked, what didn't work. And so that was always keeping us sharp and really, you know, continually moving forward, improving things. And then guys like me, you know, been around for for many years. We provide the continuity of of what, you know, what we can do, what we can't do, how to move forward and, you know, what we've tried in the past, what we need to try in the future, that kind of thing. And generally, you know, speaking, Pretty small organization, only about a hundred and about hundred and twenty or so civilians, and you know another forty or so, thirty or forty military and some contractors. But, but a lot of bang for the buck, and it was like I said, I was very blessed to work there my entire career. It was just a wonderful experience. Yeah, and um, is there is there a particular reason historically why it would be located in Monterey Bay, whether it be geographical or personnel why would it be based there well the original reason that the navy came to monterey was because of the naval postgraduate school which is there the naval postgraduate school has been in monterey since 1951 fleet numerical came to monterey in 1959 okay. and um the main draw was the fact that uh, naval postgraduate school had the world's most well had had the navy's most powerful computer and it was a controlled data corporation you know 6,400 or something like that. And, um, uh, you know, the, the Navy, we needed computers. The people that pioneered Fleet and Miracle back in those days, we needed the most powerful computers, still do. You're always trying to get more and more computer power. And so that was the, was the primary draw. But also there's a meteorology department at Naval Postgraduate School. And in the early days, um, you know, the early days of Fleet and Miracle, we drew heavily on the, that, the expertise in that department. So those are kind of the reasons that that's happened. And um, you know, now there's the Naval Research Lab, Marine Meteorology Division, a world-class scientist there. They evolved from an organization called NEPERF, Naval Environmental Prediction Research Facility, back in, that came out here back in the, in the early 60s. So there's a long, a long history and a long, uh, a long legacy of a lot of work in meteorology and oceanography here. And it's been, uh, you know, it's been a, a, a strong uh, suit for the Navy here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, talk of what I'm interested in is at your start there during that timetable to uh, when you retired in 2011. The arc of the technology during that time was, of course, just unprecedented. Oh, yeah. so, so, the question I have for you is it's almost two part. One, is there the what are the most obvious parts of uh, implementing as the technology advanced what has changed drastically over that time and what if anything stayed the same meaning whether it was approach or or using this better technology but something that maybe had stayed consistent as well mm -hmm. yeah great question yeah in the early days now for me that was in the early 80s you know 1983 is when i, I moved here um we were using punch cards you know, punched IBM cards, you know, card reader like this. And there's a really funny story, um, you know, um, in our computer center back then. Well, this was this predated me. So this would have been probably in the 70s. This happened. And it's just a story that's kind of ha handed down. I have to tell it to you. It's pretty funny. Um, a big part of our ops run was executed by having this big stack of of computer cards. IBM cards that they fed into a card reader and it went down through the card reader and it actually kicked off different programs and things ran and all that. And some of what that did was send data to the National Weather Service back in Washington, which they depended on, you know, very heavily. And uh, one particular night, I guess, <laughs> some, uh, you know, young naval uh, uh, enlisted person took that deck of cards and put it in the card reader, but they forgot to take the rubber band off. 
<laughs> and so you know, the card readers started reading down there and it just went, you know, jammed everything up and chewed up the cards and all that. And that caused the ops run to crash and the National Weather Service didn't get their data from us. And the whole weather system, you know, all around the country was impeded that day because they forgot to take that, that uh, you know, rubber band off. So that's kind of what the technology was like in the 70s. When I first went to work at Fleet in the 80s, um, you know, we were still using punch cards. I, you know, the very first few years we were doing punch cards, hand in a deck of cards. And then we got, a, we got the first terminals on our deck, on our desks. They weren't really, it was before, you know, personal computers and before the internet. So there was a hardwired, you know, I forget what it was called, but it was a really crude kind of a terminal. And then of course, it's just been a continual upgrade over the time. And, and, and of course the computers have just gotten just, you know, Moore's Law every 18 months or so, the computers are doubling and we were always trying to keep up with that. And, um, you know, I, I won't try to quote the numbers, but, you know, it's just orders yeah. of magnitude more powerful. But the fact of the matter is weather prediction models and ocean prediction models are almost an infinite sink of computer power. So you can say, OK, I'll give you a computer that's 100 times more powerful. And, you know, the model is going to kind of yawn and say, OK, I'd like a thousand times more because, you know, because what happens is it turns out that, um, you know, the name of the game is making the resolution of the models finer. So you have this like wow. think of a grid, you know, you space out a grid over the whole world and in each location like a net you know over the world each place with a net you know that's where you predict things and of course you're always wanting to make that net finer and finer and finer because then you get a, a clearer picture of what the weather and the ocean is going to be it's like imagine your digital camera you know you're you're taking pictures and you have an old one of the original digital cameras and pretty quickly it, it's all pixelated if you try to zoom in but as you go to higher and higher megapixels and you get a sharper and sharper picture that's what you're trying to do with the models well, it turns out that um, the amount, the speed of the computer you need goes um, inversely proportional to the, the cube of the grid resolution. So if you, you know, if you double the grid resolution, then you don't double the computer power. It's, it's, you know, it's two to the third power. So, you know, right. you know and is it also, is also then as you're, as you're tuning, as you're getting finer in that grid, as the technology advances, the ability to, uh, I'm going to put it in layman's terms, calculate the amount of variables within each part of that grid to then get even a clearer picture, whether it's temperature change or, you know, speed of something, the more variables you get in a finer pixel, if you will, the clearer that data coming back that then you can feed into a model and get a more accurate picture. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that, that's true. Um, you know, a key part of this whole weather prediction process and ocean prediction process is um, assimilating data. So you have ships out there making observations. You've got satellites up there making all kinds of observations. You've got uh, weather balloons being launched all around the world every six hours. And you have to be able to assimilate that data to up, update the model. And as the grid resolution gets finer and finer, then the process has to be, has to be adjusted in how you update that model, and also the way the model represents things that are going on at scales that are smaller than the grid resolution. That has to be adjusted, and that's a lot of science involved in adjusting all those things as the grid resolution gets finer. Yeah, interesting. So, as with obviously all of your connections and all your background, when you are getting ready to go surf and you want to look at a forecast, what are you using? Well, my first cut is I, you know, I'll, I'll tune into Surfline, you know, and then um, um, then I'll start looking at the Fleet Numerical products. I'll start looking at the the what the, the model that F Fleet runs now is called WaveWatch Three WW Three, third wow. generation wave model, and I'll I'll, I'll tell you a, a good story about that. I used to, you know, kind of segue into surf trips. I beginning about the um, I guess it was in the late nineties or mid nineties. I hooked back up with um, two of my um, friends from Florida in the early days, Paul Polgar and Dave Jenkins. And um, Paul Polgar lives in, in Florida and he runs a, uh, well, but he's a champion windsurfer and uh, he's also a very accomplished um, kiteboarder and a good surfer. And uh, he owns a swimwear company back there, really cool guy. Dave Jenkins lives in Stinson Beach up in the Bay Area, uh, although he yeah. divides his time between there oh, wow. and between there and Nashville. He's a musician. In fact, he's the 
founding member, lead singer, and lead guitar player for the band Pablo Cruz. And you still hear a lot of their songs on the radio. Anyway, we started doing these surf trips beginning back in the late 90s. And we did, I think we did about 25. You know, every year we would go mainly to Central America, but sometimes to sometimes to um, Mexico or South America, mainly Central America, Nicaragua, um, uh, Costa Rica, and El Salvador mainly. Well, one year, um, we were getting ready to gear up for our surf trip. It was 2015, actually. And um, Dave wasn't able to go. And Paul was able to go. It was going to be Paul and I. Um, and I wasn't feeling very well. I was in the spring. We always go in the spring. I was having these allergies. And so I wasn't really feeling very well. And I wasn't that excited about going on this trip, you know, <laughs> because Dave wasn't able to go. And it's a lot more fun if all three of us can go. So it come, it's about two weeks before the trip, you know, and I thought, well, or maybe 10 days, I don't know. And I thought, well, I better start looking about what it's going to be like. So I take a look at Surfline and then I take a look at Fleet and Miracle and I go, oh my God, it's the swell of the century and it's going to hit right when we get there. So I freak out, you know, because I'm kind of out of shape. And so I had to go, I, I call up my friend Paul and I said, man, you better get ready. It's going to be, it's going to be pumping and it's going to hit right when we get there. And so I go into a crash program, try to get a little bit in kind of shape. And, um, but I could see the swell coming, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, um, you know, the swells that hit Central America that we would always be king for in the springtime would be coming from, um, you know, the Southern Ocean, storms between, down between um, uh, South America, or sorry, um, Antarctica and uh, New Zealand in the Southern Ocean. And uh, that's really where the, you know, that's kind of the swell generation region for uh, spring and summer in the in the Central America. And then, you know, it takes about seven days for the swell to go from there to Central America. So, you know, you can actually predict a pretty long time in the future. You got a couple of days of forecast for the storm and then another seven days before the swell gets there. So you can you can predict about 10 days out. So this is about 10 days out. And I saw it was going to be just, uh, you know, swell the decade. And we got there and it was, you know, it was unbelievable. Biggest surf I've ever been out in and um, got some pictures approved. I got, oh, I, I have a, I have a website, as I mentioned, it's kahunavideo.com. It's just two words, kahunavideo.com. And yeah, we'll I put, should have mentioned. We'll put all of these links and all of the okay. um, things that we talked about today in our show notes too. Yeah. So, so yeah. you can go and check it out. Yeah. What I forgot to mention was when I, beginning about the, um, early nineties, I started making surf videos and I made about it, about eight of them, I think. And I, they're now all on the, inter, on the, um, on YouTube and, um, my website, kahunavideo.com provides a convenient link to each of the eight movies and tells you what they're all about and everything. And, um, so there's a lot of pictures on there, a lot of, a lot of stills there from including this trip, the 2015 trip, but it was huge. And, uh, fortunately, uh, Paul and I didn't drown. We made it. We survived. I almost drowned three times on that trip, <laughs> but we made it through and uh, we rode the biggest waves of our life. And it was fantastic. It was oh, it. We, awesome. did, we were surfing, surfing at Playa Sunzal, El Salvador, which is a really great spot. It's a great longboard spot. And also it's a spot that'll hold just about any size wave. It's one of the most consistent places in the world, by the way. It's good there 300 days out of the year, they tell me. And I've wow. never seen it be bad there. I've never been skunked there. I've been there so many times and I've never actually never seen it go below a head high. I've never seen it below head high there all the times I've been there. And this particular, the day that the day we finally did go out, it was about, it was uh, 20 to 30 feet. You know, there were 30 foot sets coming through the day before it was even bigger. And, uh, you know, people were drowning, you know, and, you know, and the, the main I mean, people, yeah. people weren't surfing that day, but people were going to the beach to see it and were getting washed in and drowning and waves are breaking over the end of this pier. Tremendous uh, south swell. So the first day we didn't surf, thank God. And then the next day uh, we did surf. And, you know, like I said, there were, it was 20 to 30 feet. And, you know, I got at least one 20 foot plus wave. So it was the biggest wave of my life. Oh, that's great. I have something you'll never forget, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So talk a little bit about, um, so what's kind of like your right now, like, to, so this trip, I was obviously a perfect example. You're looking 10 days out and you're like, okay, I better get on some things right here to get ready for this trip. 
do you have a consistent movement and fitness uh, program that you follow um, throughout your week to stay surf ready now? I do. I do. And you got to realize I'm really old, you know, I'm getting ready to turn 72. So there are a lot of challenges, you know, for guys that are getting old. So I'm kind of going to be talking to the guys that are my age out there. Um, so let me just say the, the stranger in me is going to jump in right here and say, at every age, there's a challenge. And so it's really mm -hmm. keeping consistent with those things. So what you're going to about to say yeah. is true for everybody, regardless well, of their age. Well, I absolutely agree with you on that. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you got, you got to stay in good aerobic shape. Um, for me over the years, that's been, uh, doing a little bit of mountain biking. I don't claim to be a good, a great mountain biker, but you know, there are some good hills around here and, and particularly, um, beginning about my forties, I guess I, I started doing a fair amount of mount, mountain biking, just recreational, you know, but that's, that's pretty darn good aerobic exercise. Um, I do a little bit less of that now, but I do a lot of walking. My wife and I have a dog and we, um, we walk every day with a dog, usually about three to five miles and oftentimes uh, through some pretty good hills and train nearby at Fort Ord and places like that. So a lot of walking up hills, you know, and I can be pretty good aerobic exercise. Um, I go to the gym three days a week, um, focus on uh, using uh, machines and a little bit of free weight. So I've been trying to be pretty consistent about that. And let's see what else. Um, you know, um, for me, it's stretching is the big issue. You know, as you get, you know, as I started to get into my late 60s, I started getting stiffer and stiffer. I was actually pretty stiff when I was a kid. You know, it's always been <laughs> kind of stiff. Even when I was a kid, I have to do a lot of stretching before I go out surfing. And that's become the big challenge for me. So I'm stretching every day. Um, and on a day when I'm going to go surfing, I do extra, or even the day before I'm going to go surfing, I do extra stretching. So, you know, stretching is a big part of it for me, trying to stay flexible, being able to get to my feet. You know, when I was younger, I was kind of the master of the late takeoff. I could do a one stroke, even a no stroke takeoff, no problem. And I was often taking really late takeoffs, but I can't do that anymore. And I hate to, I hate to admit that, but I have to admit it. And, you know, I'm, so I have to back off a little bit on that kind of thing. I've also limited on how big a waves I go out. And when I turned 70, I said, okay, well, I'm not going out in on the really big days. So I, so right now I try to keep it about 10 feet and below. And if it's going to be double overhead day, I don't even go to the beach because I know there's going to be a, you know, I, it's, it's hard for me not to go out <laughs> if I go to the beach. So I just try to avoid the days when it's big. I'm trying to keep it to about 10 feet and below. And I, <clears throat> I, I've backed off of, surfing, uh, you know, outside first peak on the bigger days at Pleasure Point. I used to be out there all the time, but I'm not quite as confident anymore about being able to take a late takeoff there and in, in the middle of a crowd and everything. So because of my sort of waning flexibility. So for me, the flexibility is the big thing. And I think consistent stretching, you know, like I said, I stretch every day and I, on certain days I, I do more. I'm still able to paddle pretty strong. You know, I'm you know, I'm st still a pretty strong paddler, but, you know, the, the flexibility is the big part of it. In general, um, diet is really important, particularly as you get into your late 60s, certainly in your 70s, you got to really worry about what you're eating. And so I focus a lot on that. And my, my wife is really good about that. She's very much into healthy cooking and healthy eating. Uh, very much last few years, we've been focusing on plant-based diet. Um, my wife doesn't hardly eat any meat. I eat um, pretty much um, chicken and turkey and fish, and that's about it. I don't eat any any red meat anymore. And I don't eat a whole lot of meat in general. We're really heavily focused on a plant-based oriented diet and um, trying to minimize, um, trying to minimize um, salt, sugar, and fat. Can't eliminate it completely, but trying to minimize salt, sugar, and fat in our diet as much as possible. And generally trying to focus on, you know, whole grains and, you know, healthy kinds of things, fruits and vegetables and that sort of thing. So the diet's a big part of it as well. And yeah, and, and touching on exactly what you're saying, sugar, salt and fat, like our, our, that's the, there's that part of our brain, that, prim, that primal part of our brain that is specifically evolved to get those things. Now, it doesn't Absolutely. have any connection to our modern life and the access that we have. 
But mm -hmm. sugar, salt, and fats, you know, we would, we crave those things because at a level they feed us. Unfortunately, our modern diet is then skewed to this place to where the abundance of sugars that we get and it's in everything. I mean, you know, back in a time where you're not having, you can't have a handful of sugar. It would be accessed only through the things that you could get. Now I'm generalizing, but mm -hmm. we are predisposed to have that ability and, and that seeking that taste. And so, yeah, to change some of those habits. And what I always tell clients and what I always tell people when they ask is you're looking to evolve those things slowly. So there isn't this feeling of deprivation. You know, if you feel really deprived of something, it's, it's much harder to sustain that change. But as mm -hmm. you do that slowly and change that back, then it just becomes part of your norm again. And um, I do want to touch back on some of the, the highlights of like your weekly movement that I think are really great. Um, the thing, the number one thing is the walking. Walk every day. Mm -hmm. I tell people mm -hmm. walk, go walk, walk yeah. more, walk every day, walk a little bit more. It's mm -hmm. so important for so many reasons. Your movement mm -hmm. for sure, your mm -hmm. ability to get some of that cardiovascular work in, and it's also mm -hmm. space. When you are walking with a partner or a friend or, you know, a child, there's space there. And so that space then gets filled with either working through something, talking, just having the ability to cue into your breath more. We in our modern life don't have space that much. It is filled because we have com supercomputers in our hands or we have another screen somewhere else. And. They're all vying for our attention and that ability to just step back and have a little space really is regenerative. It's great for just calming down. And the other things that you touched on, which I want to just reinforce to everybody listening, which is flexibility is crucial for not just healthy range of motion. It's also crucial for recovery. And I think recovery is something that those in my profession don't talk about enough. We talk about how much cardio you're getting or how much strength you're getting. And we do talk about flexibility, but we don't do a good job about talking about it in context of recovery. And recovery is probably the most important aspect for all of the things we're doing to be able to, I like to say, begin again every day. You start your day again and that flexibility, whether it's post-activity from your mountain biking, post-activity from surfing, that ability to recover is so, so important. So um, that's a, this is a great segue to talk about. Do you have um, a consistent like morning routine that you do for in context of, you know, flexibility or in context of just mindset for the day? Do you have kind of a routine that you follow every morning? Yeah, pretty much just after I get up, I'm, I'm, I do some, um, sort of warming up, you know, my, my legs and body and move around a little bit. And then I go into some light stretching and I do that even before I have breakfast, you know, and then, um, pretty much after breakfast, it's take the dog for a walk because he won't let us not do it. We've got a really great dog. He's a poodle and he, he expects to have at least two, two walks a day. So it's great because he gets us out there every day. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear what you said about walking because, I definitely agree with that. And, um, you know, we've been, my wife and I have been doing an awful lot of walking ever since we got our dog. We've had him for about eight years now and just doing lots and lots of walking. And, and you're absolutely right. It, it just, it, and the space part and, you know, being out in nature and there's some beautiful walks around here in the Monterey area. So it's, um, you know, that, that it's helps not just your, your body, but also your mind being out there and, you know, walking around and doing that sort of thing. And um, if, I'm, if today I'm going to go to the gym, I usually try to do that in the morning. You know, I usually go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or at least three days a week. And uh, very, very cognizant of the recovery like you're talking about. I, I wouldn't go two days in a row. And uh, definitely give myself recovery time on that sort of thing. Same thing with surfing. Uh, you know, I, in my younger days, I could surf. Well, I'm going on the surf trips. I'd surf, you know, every day, two sessions a day for a week, you know, and that'd be fine. But nowadays... Um, you know, I use, it's rare for me to surf two days in a row. You know, I, I feel like I almost always need recovery time after just that one day. And some of that is muscular and some of it is just the tendons and all that. Cause you, you're really having to stretch and everything. 
So uh, yeah, I'm very cognizant of the of the uh, recovery time for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and that third piece, kind of talking back on your tune, talking about going to the gym today, is 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 definitely maintaining strength, maintaining yes. your your muscle yeah. strength, maintaining that ability. Because again, we talk about muscle strength and as a almost as an output, right? I have this level of strength that I can. Mm-hmm specific to us and what's important to us is be able to paddle for a long time and be able to get this way that I maybe wouldn't have got without the muscle strength. And that is absolutely true and really important. But what's also important to think about um, for everybody listening is your muscle strength also protects your skeletal system and all of the important things that we have inside, all of our organs, all of these things. When we talk about balance, let's say, you know, and when, mm-hmm. when clients ask me about balance, I want to improve my balance. And, the, and I'll say, okay, well, what do you do to improve your imbalance? Well, I try not to fall. Well, <laughs> that's, of course, I like to invert it for them, which is to say, practice your balance, practice getting uncomfortable with your balance. So you're working on this connection with your balance and how you're implementing your strength. And then you're minimizing your risk as best you can. Now, we could talk about this all up the spectrum. From, Mm -hmm. you know, some, I still work with some elderly clients that non-surfers that I've just trained for a very long time. And that's a critical thing that we work on is balance and strength Mm and changing it from not coming from a place of fear, but minimizing risk. And then if and when something like that happens and you do fall, that muscle strength is protecting you. It's that extra Mm -hmm. layer of those things. And then thus the ability to then recover from whatever does happen to us. So we want to think about that as, as, you know, that holistic idea of everything that we're doing in our fitness and our movement is minimizing risk, raising confidence, and then building the resources to then implement to what's the most important thing to us. Now, what we're talking about and what the center of our thing is to stay in the ocean surfing till our last breath. That's our focus. We want to all be doing that. <laughs> That's absolutely right. You know, and what I, what I tell guys, older guys, you know, there was, you know, I have a lot of friends on, on Facebook and some of them are, you know, my age or older and a lot of them will express, you know, we're having a hard time, you know, still going out there. And I basically say, you know, you know, whatever it takes to keep you going out there, do it. You got to, if you're a real surfer, you know, you can't ever stop. You got to keep doing it. It's just, it's just intrinsic to your life. So what I tell guys is, you know, if it means getting a longer board, if it means going out on smaller days, if it means going out on warmer days, getting a different kind of wetsuit, if it means switching to a stand up paddleboard, whatever it takes, you know, keep going out there. You've got to, it's an intrinsic part of your life. And I, I definitely believe that. Yeah, no, I agree with that a hundred percent. And, and that, that is something I always remind myself of too, which is, of course we love the waves. And of course we love that feeling of being part of that, but, the waves are always a bonus for me. Once I paddle out, I, yeah. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied because I am just going to be a better version of myself when I get that, when I get that presence that surfing requires. I talk about this often, but you can't surf without being perfectly present. There's just too many things going on. That's when you're falling. That's when you're not catching a wave. And it really just helps you practice getting those things out to the side, clearing your mind and being present. So all of these circles that are moving and surfing, the wave, the wind, your board, other people line up to get into that perfect place of feeling that energy that's completely present. That's the goal. That's the bonus. Be just being out in the ocean oftentimes, if not every time, is enough. And that's what I tell all my clients too, same thing, that are struggling with I can't surf, you know, this big wave spot that I, I can't surf that anymore. They're pushing into their 50s or 60s now. And I say, well, yes, just change your perspective on what that is. Maybe it's a, like you said, it's a slightly smaller swell. You're still getting that feeling. Don't um, define your surfing in a very, very small space that if I can't do this, then I'm, then I'm not a surfer anymore. It's just keeping the act in your life. I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, that's kind of philosophical there about, you know, but kind of, kind of is a good segue to talk about that movie that um, yeah. I was in recently. It's called um, 
a long road to Dow, and Dow is spelled T-A-O. It's based on a, a wonderful book called uh, uh, The Dow of Surfing, uh, Finding Depth at Low Tide by Michael Allen, uh, which in turn is based on a true story um, set back in the late 80s. And it's a lot, a lot of, a lot of philosophy in there. That book, I highly recommend it. The Tao of Surfing, you know, it's a lot of um, uh, Eastern philosophy and and um, you know Taoism and so forth. And it has a real connection with surfing. The movie is going to be fantastic. Um, we just wrapped up filming a few weeks ago, and um, as I understand it, right now the plan is to uh, premiere the movie trailer in mid-April at the um, Las Cruces, New Mexico International Film Festival. So I'm looking forward to that, may even go back there. Um, the movie itself will probably be done this summer and the coming summer and premiere sometime in the fall. So really looking forward to it. Um, surfing is a sort of a background theme there. It's, it's, a, it's a heavy movie, it's a heavy theme. It's a, it's a fantastic story, a true story. It's, a, it's about life and death and friendship and acceptance and uh, it was uh, quite an experience for me, a uh, first time actor, you know, and it was really, really an amazing experience. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be a great movie. Well, uh, uh, pretty humbling to, to, to act, I'd imagine. I, I've not done it. I'm not, you know, <laughs> being around professionals, I imagine that would be like, this is difficult. <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was a challenge for sure. You know, like I said, I've never done any acting before, but um, um, you know, they put out a they put out a casting call in the local area and it appeared on the uh, newsletter of the Monterey County Film Commission, which I don't see. But two of my friends did see the casting call and they um, read the, the character Jerry, uh, Jerry Johnson, who's a um, 60 something Santa Cruz surfer, surf shop owner, kind of mentor to the lead character. And they said, hey, this sounds just like you. Two different people said this sounds just like you. Why don't you audition for this? So they sent me that email. And I said, well, what the hell? I'll give it a shot. So I sent an email into the casting director with uh, some pictures and some video clips of me surfing. They were looking, they were specifically looking for a surfer. They said, we want a guy who really surfs and uh, doesn't necessarily have to be an actor, but got to be a surfer. So I thought, what the hell? I'll give it a shot. And um, so I sent some pictures in, some video clips, and I heard back from the casting director immediately. And she said, uh, you could be just right for this role. Here's what you got to do. So I had to go through an audition process which wasn't easy. I had to learn lines for three different scenes and act them out in my living room in front of a video camera and send off that video. And later on, I had to do a, a Zoom with her and, and act out a couple scenes live, you know, that kind of thing. It was pretty hard. But uh, lo and behold, after about a month, um, uh, they said, okay, you're the guy. You're, you're in. You're going to be the guy. So I took it real serious. I started working with a... Um, a um, uh, acting coach in Monterey, had a couple sessions there with him. And I worked really hard on learning my lines and, and kind of seeing the whole flow of the storyline and how my character fit in and all that. And uh, we did a table read, which is uh, the whole cast goes through the entire script. The most of the cast was in New Mexico at the time. A lot of the story plays out in New Mexico and they were back there getting ready to film the New Mexico parts of the story. So I was coming in via Zoom. And that was kind of hard because I couldn't really see the other actors and had a hard time hearing, but we got through the whole script and all that. And then um, suddenly, um, uh, you know, it was time to do it. And, uh, you know, there was a fair amount, fair amount of pressure because I realized pretty early on that, um, you know, my character was was crucial to the story. And if if I couldn't deliver, the, the movie was going to crash. You know, and they had only a week to, to do our stuff. So. Most of uh, the scenes I, I was in were filmed at uh, Greyhound Rock, which is uh, about 26 miles north of Santa Cruz. Beautiful venue, it was a perfect location. They were talking about a couple other locations before that. At one point, it was gonna be at Point Lobos, which is down in Carmel. Um, beautiful spot, but it would've been hard to make it look like a surf spot. That fell through and then it was gonna be um, out at Pebble Beach. Uh, probably wasn't the greatest venue there, too many people around. And so finally, at the very last minute, uh, they picked up uh, approval from Santa Cruz County to do it at Greyhound Rock, which is a real surf spot, you know, by the way, it's up just the site of Vanya Nuevo. And it was just, it's just a gorgeous venue and it was perfect for it. We had some little bit of challenging weather earlier in the week, but we had some beautiful days there too. And so most of the scenes I was in were, were filmed there. We did uh, do um, two scenes in Santa Cruz, one out on the wharf at a restaurant there. 
inside the restaurant and another at a, at a residence on 25th Avenue. But most of my stuff was up at Greyhound Rock and um, really appreciated um, the lead actor, Casey Dean. He plays uh, the, the character Dane, which is the lead character in the, in the film. Fantastic actor, young guy. He's probably mid thirties. Um, fantastic actor, writer, director, producer. He can do it all. And he kind of he worked with me. He took me under his wing, and you know he helped me. And um, we would go off to the side and act out scenes, and sit in his car and act out a scene. And you know uh, that was really helpful. Michael Allen, uh, the producer of the film, who who wrote the book, and he's actually the real life Dane. Um, very supportive and very helpful. Um, and the director, Alex Carrick was very, very supportive and was really, uh, really helped me, uh, get through it. And the, the, the great thing about this movie is they, they did it in conjunction with, uh, the film department at New Mexico State University. So the, um, director of photography, Sherwin Lau is the professor back there and all the support staff, you know, the, the grips and crew and the, and the camera crew and all that, they were all his students from New uh, Mexico State University, great. all these kids. And they were so great. They were so motivated and so on top of it. They were fantastic from every every thing you could think of. They were just really on top because they're motivated to make this movie really good because it's going to be there on their resume for when they go out into the real world. So it was just fantastic. It was a great experience. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing it come out. I'm, uh, I, it says a lot in the beginning as, we, as you started describing that. It says a lot that the casting director it, it says a lot on how difficult surfing is to say mm -hmm. we need a surfer we'll teach you how to act but we're not going to teach an actor how to surf <laughs> yeah yeah the great thing about it is the two lead characters uh casey dean and jason bernardo they're both surfers and they're they're pretty good you know they're both guys in their 30s i think and uh you know actually one day um after the we were finished filming um uh, we all three went out and surfed at um Greyhound Rock it wasn't a great day, but you know we were having fun there, and uh, they're real surfers too. So you know it's a, yeah the the casting I think in the movie is is really good, and I think it's going to be um, be really good. It's it's going to be uh, you know it's going to be it's going to be a, about you know surfing is an important part of it, but it's 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 about so much more, and I think yeah. um, people are going to really enjoy it. Yeah, that sounds great. The surfing is the thread between stories that. A surfer, you don't need to be a surfer to relate to, is my is my imagination. It's, it's really looking at a lot of these larger storylines to be able to, yes. to to relate. And surfing's just the thread that kind of pulls it together. That's exactly it. Surfing is a thread yeah. that pulls it together, and it, as it was for the original story, so it's it's going to be good. What an uh, what an interesting uh, opportunity that that came into, like a general casting mm -hmm. call that then goes into. I mean. Not anything you expected, obviously, and and what a what a fun path to go down, you know, at any point in life. But after, uh, you know, all of your surfing through all of the decades, and then have this kind of experience come together, it's very unique. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was I was an extra in uh, Chasing Mavericks. I was oh, yeah. in the uh, in the uh, padlock scene, and of course, I know Frosty very well. Frosty and I have been surfing together for years. We're actually the, almost exactly the same age. And um, and that was fun. You know, I, I got to see what Hollywood's all about, you know, out there in the, the big paddle out scene for Jay Moriarty. And that was kind of interesting. It was a, it, I, I think it, I think they it took 20 million dollars. I read to, to do Tracy Mavericks. It was a pretty big deal. Yeah. And um, it was fun to to watch that. Then I then it came on the screen and I went to the movie and I, I knew where the paddle out scene was. I knew where I was. I didn't see myself. I thought, oh, bummer. You know, all that effort didn't get in there. But then. You know, over the next few weeks, people were saying, hey, I went to see J.C. Mavericks and I saw you there and they had a lot scene. I thought, ah, they're just imagining it because I didn't see myself. So but I kept hearing that from people. So finally, I went out and bought the the DVD and I put it in the TV and I was playing it and I stopped it right there. And there I was for two point <laughs> four seconds. <laughs> You're like, ah, yes, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but in in uh, a long road to Tao, I'm I'm in about I think I'm in nine scenes and I've got a speaking role in in eight of them, and wow. um, yeah. it was pretty significant. And most most of my dialogue is with uh, the lead character played by Casey Dean, and you know we have some pretty good um, interactions going on there. I think it's going to be good. 
Oh yeah, that sounds that sounds wonderful. We'll, we'll put we'll put all the links to that in the show notes and stuff for people to check out. Um, talk a little bit about. Um, I, I think you're still the director. It was on the side, like about the Monterey County Citizens Climate Lobby that you're involved with. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, beginning about five years, four or five years ago, I started um, um, speaking about climate change, and actually, it started out with. Um, the local chapter of, of CCL Citizens Climate Lobby, which I didn't belong to at the time. They were going to have an event in Monterey, one event in Monterey, one in Salinas, to show a movie called um, uh, The Age of Consequences. It's a, it's a documentary about how uh, the U.S. military is dealing with climate change. And one of the um, primary um, uh, stars of that movie was... Uh, a uh, former boss of mine, Admiral Dave Titley, U.S. Navy Admiral D Dave Titley. And he was going to be here and narrate, or at least, you know, be the master ceremonies for the event. But he had to cancel out, couldn't do it. And so he referred them to me. He said, well, why don't you get Mike to do it? So they gave me a call and I thought, okay, sure. If Admiral Titley wants me to do it, I'm not saying no. But at that time, I didn't really know much about climate change. And I suddenly realized after I started meeting with them, there was going to be a, a really big event. There's going to be a lot of people there. And our Congressman uh, Jimmy Panetta was going to be on the stage with me. So I thought, you know, I better get smart on climate change really fast here. So I started really digging into it. And pretty quickly, I thought, well, I better put some slides together here just in case there's going to be questions coming up. So I started putting together slides and everything. And uh, the events went really well. And I got a lot of positive feedback for being the master of ceremonies there. And, and pretty much immediately, people started inviting me to come and speak to the Rotary Club or whatever, some local civic activity about climate change. So I started doing that and I started, you know, learning more and more and, and building out, um, you know, my presentations. So I've didn't, I've done probably 40 or 50 presentations in the last few years, local civic groups. I've got a YouTube channel. We'll put the link in the thing. It's climate change matters with Mike Clancy. Most of my talks are on there. I did a six part, uh, series, a six part lecture series last spring. It's, um, I did three lectures on science, two lectures on technology, one lecture on policy. So if you want to spend six hours listening to me talk, you'll learn a lot about climate change, pretty much climate change, soup to nuts. And then about a year ago, um, the previous um, um, uh, chair of Citizens Climate Lobby asked me to take over and, and I agreed to do that. And so I've been uh, chairing the Monterey County chapter since then. So I'm very proud to be involved with CCL. I think they're the best organization dealing with climate around. And um, a lot of implications for surfers, you know, with climate change. For example, one of the recent talks I gave, and it's on my YouTube channel, had to do with uh, sea level rise and the impact on, uh, you know, coastal California. And one of the things I showed there was a, a, a video from the Surfrider Foundation. They did a really nice about five, five or ten minute video on implications of um, sea level rise for recreation in California, including surfing. So, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of surfers are involved. I think it was, um, it was a, a, a Dwayne DeSoto, the great Hawaiian surfer, Dwayne DeSoto, his two daughters were on, I think it was uh, um, the Today Show or maybe Good Morning America, one of the morning shows a few months ago, talking about what they're, they're doing in Hawaii to help um, combat climate change and talking about the impact on coral reefs and things like that and how that might affect surfing in, in, um, in Hawaii. Generally speaking, you know, surfers, and, I, and I'm sure you know this as well, Greg, surfers uh, from the very beginning, they tend to be very environmentally conscious, tuned into the environment, tuned into the ocean, tuned into the weather, because, you know, that's, that's the environment we play in. And um, so I think surfers are tending to become more and more engaged on climate change, and I'm, I'm glad to be involved. And obviously climate change and the science behind it and all of the policies, there could be several other episodes that we could talk and get really in depth on. But if, if you kind of had to bring down such a complex, large um, issue that impacts us all as surfers, would you have something that we, that an individual surfer could prioritize in their life that would have, sometimes I feel like when we take these big issues, we'll, we'll tend to, uh, will tend to pull back from them because they do feel so overwhelming. And it's hard to picture something that we can take a tangible step on that will have an impact. But is, is there, do you ever think of maybe one, two or three things that 
we all can think about in our day-to-day -day lives that can have an impact positively going forward? You know, the one most important thing by far is to vote, particularly for the younger folks who oftentimes don't vote, to vote, you know, find out, find out uh, what the position is of your, your local congressional representative, your, your senator, your city council person, you know, your school board member, whatever, you know, whatever level, vote and, and um, you know, find out what their positions are on climate change. Down at the city council level, it's real important because, you know, uh, a lot of what needs to happen is going to happen it locally um, at the city council level in terms of what they're going to do with regard to, you know, trying to minimize the city's greenhouse gas emissions, trying to to uh, deal with landfills, all that kind of stuff. So you can make a big, you can make a big, um, uh, you know, effort there. What you want to do is find out who the leaders are in your community, find out what their positions are on climate change. Let them know that that you care about the issue and you want to see action taken. Become a leader yourself. You know, a lot of the people listening to this, this podcast are either already leaders in their community or can become leaders in their community. So take it on board, go out there, become a leader and, um, uh, try to move things in the right direction. In terms of what we do personally, you know, you can always try to try to minimize your carbon footprint while maintaining your, 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 a, a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, for example, my, my wife and I, uh, last year, we, uh, we, uh, uh, added rooftop solar to our house, five kilowatt array, and, uh, also, a, a Tesla power wall. So essentially off the grid, you know, we're pretty much self-contained and we also bought an electric vehicle and, um, uh, we're, you know, we're pretty much um, charging electric vehicle from our solar array and driving around for free with a zero carbon footprint. And that's a that's probably more than most people are going to do. But, you know, things in that along those lines are things to kind of, you know, maybe in the long term set your your goals on. Yeah. And coming into um, this next year, 2023, as all of the specifics start to settle down, Start to look and be aware of uh, the money available to do exactly what Mike's talking about. The ability to upgrade your panel, the ability to get solar um, and money that was, is significant um, to get you in that direction to kind of implement some of these, these things. They're not just distant attainable. It's, it's going to be much more attainable for a broader array of people to really move towards those things. So yeah, those are some great ideas. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you being on Surf Strong Elite and all of the work that you've done throughout your career. And I appreciate that you're still surfing. It's a it's a, a goal to have for all the surfers out there. Stay moving, stay in the water, and you're doing that. So thanks again for being part of what we're doing here. Hey, thanks a lot for inviting me. And by the way, keep up the good work at, at Surf Strong Fitness because uh, I've looked at some of your stuff and you know what you're doing there and it's right on target. And a lot of people can benefit that, including me. And so I really appreciate what you're doing there. You know what you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's so important to do that training. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you're, you're out there and helping people because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that needs to be done for sure. I'm happy to have you here, and thanks for that. I, I, I love what I do, and I'm really lucky to be able to do it. Thank you for tuning in to the Surf Strong Elite podcast. Everything that we touched on today will be available in the show notes. You can find those at surfstrongfit.com slash podcast. Please subscribe, like, comment on this episode and all of our social media channels that you can find at at surfstrongfit. It helps us reach more surfers, and that is our goal to help surfers stay strong in the ocean till their last breath.